This is the Home Service Expert Podcast with Tommy Mello. Let's talk about bringing in some more money for your home service business. Welcome to the Home Service Expert, where each week, Tommy chats with world-class entrepreneurs and experts in various fields like marketing, sales, hiring, and leadership to find out what's really behind their success in business. Now, your host, the Home Service Millionaire, Tommy Mello. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Home Service Expert. My name is Tommy Mello. I'm here today with Matt Jones from Australia. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. He's the founding partner, a digital expert for TradingMate Pro, which Trady means contractor. He's the owner and facilitator of the Site Shed, which is a podcast, and the founder and director of Trady Web Guys. The Site Shed podcast came uh, fast, became one of the world's leading business podcasts for tradies and contractors. They've got well over 100 episodes now, uh, just recorded 190, and they've had influencers from all over the globe. Matt, I'm really excited to have you on today because you have a background in the plumbing industry, and I want to hear a lot about that. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Tommy. All the way from Oz. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Monday there. It's Sunday my time. I want to hear a little bit about uh, your plumbing experience and and how you got into marketing. Yeah. Well, um, I suppose... Coming from Sydney, so I, I did my apprenticeship on the on the North Shore of Sydney in Australia. I apologise for the listeners out there as well if you can't understand my funny accent. You just have to uh, try and <laughs> get through it. <laughs> so, like a lot of young Australians do when they complete their tertiary studies, they tend to travel, and um, I was no exception. I finished my uh, plumbing licensing course on a Wednesday, and I flew out on a Friday and I didn't come back for the better part of three years. Went and went over to Canada for a year, the United States for a year, went to the Europe for a year. It was good actually, it was a good experience. I got to um, I got to use my trade in a lot of those places, which is a bit of a bit of a lesson for those people out there that, that think doing a trade will get you stuck into one position. That's not always the case. It can take you around the world. It's taken me around the world many times. And then I, while I was away, I started taking an interest in business and I started reading a lot of business books. And um, I, I came back to Australia and I, st- I started up a, a plumbing company and I was doing that. And I thought, you know what, I just really, I want to learn more about the business side of things. You know, like I really want to get in there and, and work in business. So I took a position with a company in Australia, which was selling a plumbing product. And we effectively brought technology in from Europe and we distributed it throughout Asia Pacific. And um, yeah, from there, I, we had a lot of clients who were selling them these this equipment and these tools, a lot of them would call me and they'd say, Matt, you know, uh, this is great. We've got all the gear, but if we don't start selling this stuff, that trailer you sold me is going to become my bedroom. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, you guys have got to start marketing it. You've got to get it up on your website and let people know that you do this stuff. And um, they would commonly say, well, yeah, great, except I haven't got a website. And so for a couple of these guys, I built websites and um, one thing led to another and it got to a point where I was sort of getting enough work from that where I didn't really need to be in the job anymore, which I wasn't really liking. So as a result, I left. I started uh, the business, which back then was Plumbing Web Guys. We just did basically websites for, for plumbing companies. Um, and that very quickly morphed into Trading Web Guys. And as you alluded to in the introduction, in Australia here, we call contractors tradies, which is a abbreviation for tradesmen, <laughs> tradespeople. And then, um, yeah, so we were doing a lot of education in that space. I was talking at colleges, which over here we call TAFE, which is basically tertiary education. It's where you learn your trade. Um, I was talking at the Department of Education, which is a government-run body, which sort of governs the course curriculums and that kind of stuff for the plumbing department. And I thought, this is great. Like I'm getting really good feedback from the room of 50 people that are here, but you know, how do I sort of get this content out to the masses? So from there, I thought I might try and start a podcast. And so that was in 2016. That was after I'd been running the business for probably the better part of four years. So I started the site shed and that's basically within five days, we hit new and noteworthy in iTunes and we're still there today. We're, um, as you said before, we've just recorded episode 190. So we're very well established. And yeah, it's been from strength to strength with that. Recently, we've launched TradyMate Pro, which is effectively a business training program for trade business owners. That's the moment just targeting the Australian market, but um, that may go broader than that in the near future, which I can't say too much about. But yeah, it's been a very interesting journey. 
I love it. I love talking about marketing. Marketing is my passion. It's what drives me. And I'm very good at the offense and business. I really tend to see guerrilla marketing. I do every channel from Google pay-per-click to Craigslist posting to just networking. And I love what I do. And I'm really good on the offense. I think a lot of us are not very good at that. And uh, another thing is they're not very good at the defense. So it's hard to figure out what you're the best at. The account type people, when they're accountants and they're CPAs and they're checking all the details, they're definitely better at the defense. When you're like me, you're a macro guy, you're ready at the offense. Tell me a little bit about what you tend to see with most contractors you work with, because you see everybody from A to Z, where are they lacking the most when it comes to going out and aggressively getting new business? The big disconnect, one that we see over and over again, and one that we really focus a lot of our attention on that for, as a service um, offering is just helping them tell their story better. Because so many of these, so many of our customers and so many of our clients, you know, they do these amazing things. Like they're, they're not in the house building business. They're in the life transformation business. So that paradigm thinking alone is often enough to flick a switch in their mind. But, um, you know, they go and do these amazing projects and then what they, what they don't do is tell their story very well. You know, they don't, they don't showcase it on their website. And it's amazing content. They're just in such an amazing position to create this incredible content and they just don't do it. So we spend a lot of our attention helping them do that getting them on their websites. We build them their websites, which is, you know, is, is effectively a marketing tool for them. It enables them to get on there and enables them to add content, update their content, all that kind of stuff. We try and encourage them not to treat it as a static tool that they must have because their competitors have got it. And then we teach them how they can keep the content coming on their website. They can keep adding to it. They can keep building it. And that serves two purposes. You know, that's a that obviously is there as a tool that they can then show to their potential customers and they can, you know, send them, somebody rings them up and says, hey, have you ever done any, for example, home renovations in the, you know, the North Shore of Sydney area? They can say, yeah, cool, of course, okay. here's a couple of links to my website and they can send them actual projects, you know, which really tells a story. And then, of course, it's been optimized for the search engines too. So it means they're, they're also showing up in search queries relating to that given search phrase, whichever it's been optimized for. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think the, the big disconnect there is a lot of the guys, they're just not great at telling their story when they've got such an amazing resource available to them to be able to do it. Like It's sort of mind-boggling. So when you think about telling your story, tell me a little bit about, because I think that's an interesting topic to discuss for the listeners out there. Yeah. Where do you start? And where are you putting the story so people could understand the story? And tell me a little bit about what you look for, because I know the story has to be compelling and it needs to definitely be move the customer to take an action. So talk to me a little bit about how that process is done. See, so the thing is, right, like a lot of a lot of our customers, and I'm sure you're the same, you know, you're dealing with a lot of service offerings. So say it's builders or guys that do project-based work, it's got quite a long sales cycle sometimes. So what we found over the years is the contractor that invests in educating that lead from the point where they send their bid or proposal to them to the point where they may be ready to purchase or engage them. I mean, that could be 12 months, 18 months, could be 24 months. You never know. Like if someone's shopping around for home renovation experts, like that, that lead time could be quite a long time. So if you've invested in a way that you can keep in touch with that person and educate them and help them with that decision-making process from the time they come to you and then the time they're ready to buy, of course, you're going to stand out in their mind. Like it's just a no-brainer. So the content process and the, the idea around creating content and getting it on your website and telling your story is really about just keeping in touch with people and having a reason to keep in touch with people and then giving them information that they're actually looking for. I mean, they came to you for a service, so give them information about it. Like that's basically the bottom line. So at A1 Garage Door Service, we call it REF. We talk every day, every morning meeting about REF. Rapport, educate, follow up. And you know, we specialize in building rapport and then the education process is so very important. And I love what you're talking about because every listener out there, I'm sure, has a website for the most part. And they, there's, I guarantee you, most of them are sitting static. There's what's yeah. called an RSS feed. And there's so many ways to 
syndicate stuff right onto the website and add very, very good content to where you're actually, if you're tagging the stuff properly, which is not tough, it's, it's easy to do. You get found in the search engines, you get found on YouTube, you get found all over the place. I mean, tell us some, some of your secret sauce on, on how to make that simple and easy for a home service business owner. Well, one of the one of the easiest ways to do it is so. And if you want to show, so it's a the strategy that we typically help guys um, implement is it comes as part of an SEO strategy or it comes standalone. But the, typically, the idea is not to not to go too broad with search criteria. So, you know, if you do a home renovation in a in say a suburb in Sydney, then target that area. Don't necessarily target home renovation in Sydney because the likelihood of you showing up is less. Now, you know, sure, if you're doing like a broader um, SEO strategy, then you can go for those more macro terms. However, with a content strategy, the idea behind it is, you know, if you can get a whole a complete resource of, of little projects for local areas, then you one by one start checking these areas off for the service you do and the location you're doing it at. And that's really powerful. So, I mean, we found like typically for, this is a very typical result as well for, you know, the clients we work with, you know, within a week or two, they're ranking number one for that service and location. And sure, it might not be a highly searched term, but it's not necessarily the point because a lot of these guys, they're using this as a way that they can, first of all, take that content they've created and communicate that to their audience so they can send it out to their database, they can send it out to their customers, they can do all that kind of stuff. The secondary effect, of course, is the SEO benefits and the fact that it will show up in search queries. And, and, we, and we know like it's, it, it works so crazily well because we don't go too broad on it. It shows up so much easier and it means that you know, once you've got a whole bunch of these little projects that have all been created, um, they're starting to cover a lot of ground in the more location-based places. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I think everywhere is going way more local. Google's whole thing right now is to be more micro-targeted. And you guys use Google in Australia, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I just didn't know if there was a, another search engine that was as popular as Google, but... No, we can... Know it. In other countries, Google might not be as popular, but I got to tell you that uh, I'm a big fan of search engine optimization as well as paid advertising on Google. I think it's one of the most powerful tools of a business. I mean, right now I spend about 100 grand a month just on paid Google. Uh, wow. My goal is to be to 500000 a month by the end of the first quarter. So I'm aggressively growing on the paid side. And yep. what people don't understand is there's a lot of things that go into that. There's a quality score. There's time on page. There's click-through rates. There's how good is the result that got found and how long did they stay on the page? So the more yep. content and the more engaging content, the nice infographics, videos, things of that nature... And uh, a pop-up chat. All this stuff plays into the quality score. And so many people don't believe in it. And that's what's so funny, Matt, is I just think that it's crazy to me that people, uh, they don't believe in paid. And a lot of people don't believe in marketing in general. They say, I get, I get enough business from referrals. Why would I want to market? Yeah. What, what do you have to say to somebody out there that I guess they're fine with their business. They're going to be a one or two man shop. And I, I completely understand that. And I'm not discounting it. But if they want to grow a real business where they have employees and they're not working in it, they're working on it, what do you recommend for them as far as marketing? Well, so one of, um, I just had a guest on, on the site shed not long ago, a North American, one of your fellow North American gentlemen, um, Ferez Eslabar. He's from a, a company up in Ottawa called the Ottawa General Contractors. And he said to me, and this guy's got like a, a large business that reaches right across Canada. And he said, your business, if you're running off word of mouth, you will survive up to you know a million or a couple of million bucks a year if you're a builder, but you won't go beyond that. He goes, if you want to grow a business, then you have to invest in marketing. And I thought that was really powerful. And that, that's a reality. You know, at some point you're going to run out of word of mouth referrals. I mean, there's only so many that are going to be generated. So if you really want to take your business to the next stage, then you're going to have to start investing in a strategy which is going to be generating you more leads. Um, and that's coming from a guy that's done it, right? Like that's not just me talking. That's, that's someone that's actually done it. So I think what you kind of alluded to in that last 
just, just before there was what I like to call the, the digital ecosystem. There's a lot of things that you need to consider. And, you know, like you said, okay, sure, you know, you've got a, a Google ad that's showing you up in a search for a certain keyword. However, what does that journey look like for the customer once they click on the ad? You know, are they getting the relevant information? Is there a way that they can opt in for something? Is there a remarketing strategy behind it which makes you present from searches that follow and all this kind of stuff? So there's no, like, in my opinion, there's no real cookie cutter approach to the marketing landscape for contractors. It's a matter of testing and measuring and see what works uh, well and what's converting the best. And very often that will be a combination of different techniques, a combination of things like banner ads, Google ads, SEO, who knows, even maybe social marketing. But certainly the way that you're going to get engagement from your customers and the way that you're going to build trust and rapport is through effective, organic content. And so, you know, once somebody clicks on that ad, is their experience going to be good? Like, is it just going to be an ad that runs into a page saying, you know, buy now, save 10%? Or is it going to be an interesting piece of content which you've created, which talks about, which addresses the problems that they're experiencing? Something like that. So, there's a journey there. Yeah, you know, for the companies that don't do a lot of marketing, I recommend starting with low-hanging fruit. And low-hanging fruit to me is deal of the day sites like Groupon, Living Social. Uh, There's pay-for-performance deals. But basically, any Yelp specials, any Angie's List specials, the deal is that when you do these things, you only pay if the deal gets bought. So you do not pay a dime. You've got expected results. It's static. It's fixed cost. You pay a percentage of each deal you sell. And it's low-hanging fruit. And you can predict that you're definitely going to have a job if you're spending money. And I like that because it gives you a little bit more platform to start on. Because so many people say, marketing doesn't work for me. I tried this. I tried that. I've done this. What do you guys play in Australia? What's a good sport that you guys follow that's also an American sport? Uh, Rugby. Rugby. Do you play rugby? Oh, not anymore. Back when I was younger, I did. (laughs) So with rugby... Let me ask you this. How do you know if you're, you're ahead? I mean, what, what, what position did you play, first of all? Um, I was a halfback. So, yeah, I, I mean, I used to tell you, yeah, basically we were the, you might call that the first receiver, if you will. Okay, so when you guys played rugby, how did you guys know when you were ahead or not? Well, typically the score. So you guys kept score. So that's, that's exactly what I wanted you to say because uh, so many of us do marketing. And we don't keep score. We don't track it. We don't know if it's working. We don't know if we're winning the game. We don't know if we're losing. We don't know if we need to drop this marketing campaign or if we need need to renegotiate or if we're doing so good, we should take a pile of money and put a ton of money into it. I think that so many people don't understand the law of diminishing returns. And that means spend as much money until you're not making any more on that advertising source because you're getting in front of customers. And if you've got a good follow-up system, you're posting their reviews online, you're getting video testimonials, you're syndicating it, you're transposing it so Google can pick it up, you're putting it on your website, you're killing it. And so many people, they go, yeah, it's just not working. I'm like, how do you know? Well, I didn't get any phone calls. Well, how many types of marketing are you doing? Yeah. Realistically, they're not, they're not tracking anything. They're not keeping score. And I have a problem with that because I hear this all the time, especially with businesses to about 2 million and less. They say, well, I don't really believe in that stuff. It doesn't work. They did it for a month and then they give up. And I promise exactly. you, I was in their shoes once and it does work. And I felt the same way they do. So what is the thing that you tell these entrepreneurs to get them in the game and have them start playing it, but also keeping score? I think um, like what you touched on is quite important there. I think a lot of the guys, like they need to appreciate that a marketing strategy is it takes time. And it doesn't matter if it's AdWords or SEO. The worst it will ever be for Google AdWords is when you launch your campaign. And that's always going to be the first month. So data in the system, you've got to get that data so you can optimize and improve it and all this kind of stuff, right? But people, that needs to be communicated. And that very often comes, I think, as a fault from the service provider. You know, like we, we as marketing specialists sometimes neglect to inform people that... Guys, this is a six, 12 month uh, strategy here. You can't just pull the trigger on this thing and expect the phone to be ringing tomorrow. It's not how it works. You got to get data in the system. You got to be able to test and improve and all this kind of stuff. So I think it's important that people appreciate that and understand that. And then looking forward, 
there's a lot of things that need to be be addressed. Like guys will, you know, run run Google AdWords and spend all this money, and you know they'll get their phone ringing, they'll pick up their phone, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, hello, nah, not interested, so yeah, and that, and then you, so you do call tracking on these guys, and you think, guys, you're getting these leads and you're blowing them off. So there's a whole other thing that needs to be considered there as well. Like, what does that journey look like from the customer? You know, how they're being treated, how they're being spoken to. Like, I mean, I don't know if you've had a similar experience over there, but um, you know, very often, you know, some sales training comes into play, and then you know, there's that whole onboarding journey as well. So when a lead comes through, what does it look like? First of all, when that lead hits the website, is the website built to convert? Like, is there, you know, web form they can for that is a click to call phone number all this kind of stuff is it a landing page or is it a home page where they have to go and go searching for the service they just seen the ad for that'll also lower conversions so then you've got to make sure that journey looks right and then you've also got to make sure that when they, when they reach out and they contact the person that they get back in contact with them or that being led down the right path you know they're, they're having a job booked in or they're getting the information they're looking for whatever that might be you know it's not always a matter of okay i need to run ads it's, it's more often a matter of, you know, in the initial stages, designing what that um, journey looks like to make sure that when you do start running ads, that you're getting the best value out of your money from that cost per click or SEO, whatever it might be. But I think that's a really important step that most, a lot of people neglect. They just don't really consider that journey. Is that your experience? Well, I'll tell you what, you do marketing for one reason, and that's to generate a phone call or a form fill. Once that comes in, that's the first signal that your business is working. And your job as your CSR is to book the damn phone call. And it's mm-hmm. to get the guy, the technician, the salesman, the main dude out to the home. Then you're supposed to get the agreement side and start the work. And then mm-hmm. you're supposed to maximize that opportunity. And then your company makes what's called profit. A lot of people listening have never heard of that word because they work every day to make a paycheck. You should be able to make hundred grand a year and still make 18 to 20% profit. That's why you're a business. If you wanted a job, go get a job working for somebody because it's not worth it to make a good paycheck to be in business because so many things could go wrong and you can get the, the rug swept from under you. So I will say again, you need ads that generate phone calls or form fills. You need to get your technician out to the home and not sell it over the phone. You need to get the agreement signed, start the work, maximize the opportunity, which is your average ticket. So first conversion rate, then average ticket, and then you need to bring in profit. And you need to track those results because if you're not tracking them, you can't find the problems. I was on the phone with a guy the other day and he told me, you know, I I don't understand. A lot of the marketing doesn't work. I said, well, let me ask you this. How many jobs are you closing? It was about 30%. And I said, dude, forget marketing. That's the last thing we need to focus on. We need to make sure you guys are selling the ticket right that you're getting. We need to make sure that they're closing the deal. So average ticket, closing the deal. We need to make sure that we're booking each phone call and that your ads are actually generating phone calls. But right now, I can tell you your number one problem is you're showing up to the house, but you're not earning the business. You're not selling the problems. And he said, well, there's a lot of guys around me that are cheaper than me. I said, that doesn't matter. I'm the most expensive, but I give the best result. I said, you don't... Money is what 99% of contractors think about. I need to be the cheapest, but they don't understand the cost of doing business. Simply yeah. add up all your bills, add up your payroll, add up everything, your widgets, all the cost of goods sold, add the percentage you need to make on that and divide it by the amount you're selling that month. And that needs to be the true cost. Otherwise, and be generous with your numbers. Put new trucks, put nice computers, put a good phone system. Because if you don't do those things, I promise you, you will be out of business or you'll be hating to go to work every day. Am I right? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a big thing. Like understanding your costs and understanding what your chargeable rate needs to be. Like that's a really big hurdle that a lot of guys, uh, we, you know, we certainly try and encourage them to learn that. And there's, I mean, there's so many like sales specialists and things like that that have these you know, hourly rate calculators. I mean, we've got, I think we've got three and the site shared resource page alone from different people. You know, like there's, there's resources there to help you make sure you're charging the right amount. And what you said is exactly right. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of people out there will say, well, my competition aren't charging that much money. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. It just means that they're wrong. So you don't always want to play in that market. You don't want to be the bottom feeder. You don't want to be the guy at the bottom. <laughs> Otherwise, it's exactly that. It's a race to the bottom. Yeah, I, I see a lot of people do that. It's, it's like the pill of death. They think they need to be the cheapest. They think they got it all figured out. 
And they're really going into this thing, the wrong mentality. I mean, it really is. They just have no idea how to do it the right way, but they, they don't know any better. That's the problem is I, I just, I wish, well, I'm glad because when I get to talk to guys, here's some of the low hanging fruit too, is your vendors will pay for your marketing. They won't pay for all of it, but they've got what's called co-op. And if you endorse their brand and people are calling to buy their brand, whether that's a type of brick, if you're a bricklayer, or it's a type of garage door opener or a type of air conditioning unit. And the negotiation starts like this. Mr. So-and-so Smith at, uh, let's just say it's a, a big air conditioning unit manufacturer. Right now, I'm really a, a pimple on, on your ass, really. I'm, I'm a tiny guy, and I understand that. But here's the deal. I'm working with people. I got some consultants. I got a good staff. My goal is to get to this. If I'm able to hit that goal this year, what kind of co-op can you got, offer me? Obviously, I'm shooting for the stars here. If I land on the moon, we're doing good. But please give me a goal to hit. And when I hit that goal, some of them will work with you more than others. The smaller brands have more flexibility than the big ones. The big ones usually will do 1% to 4%. But one to four percent adds up, but they'll pay half sometimes of your booth at a home show because you're putting their product all over the place. So yeah. there's a lot of ways to get marketing without spending it out of your own pocket. You just gotta look, read between the lines, and really dig to see what vendors want to work with you. Have you ever uh, experienced that with co-op? Not so much with co-op, but I'll tell you one of the big things that we work help guys work through is. But obviously, you get people calling every day because they're, and, the, and the common query is, okay, I need more leads. Let's get more leads. Let's get more leads. And then I say, okay, cool. One of the first things I always ask them is, let's talk about your current database. Let's talk about you know, how many customers you've worked with in the past and you know, where is that information stored. And you know, some, of these, some of these guys will turn around and say, yeah, well, you know, I've got a database of 20,000 people that have worked for me and they've, I've never once communicated to them. And so it's like you said just then, you know, it's not always about spending the money on ads. Like marketing comes in many shapes and forms. And, you know, when you're sitting on a database of 20,000 people and you've never once reached out to any of them, I mean, yeah, sure, you can go and spend more money on ads and you can try and bring new people into the business or you could send out one campaign to your database and you'll probably get 80% higher conversion off that email than you would off any cold ad. So there's a number of different ways that you can attack the marketing dynamic and it ties into like I was saying before that digital ecosystem you know you've just really got to have a bit of a strategy around it I agree with you wholeheartedly that the best tactic out there one of my plans is to start buying companies that's how I'm going to grow I've grown to 12 states well over 250 people now uh, I've grown organically I bought out a couple of businesses but from now on I'm going to buy out businesses and the strategy is to take their old list yeah. And number one, send a survey to every single person. Get the yeah. people to start interacting with me. The next thing is, they had a good experience, get them to leave a review and give them a benefit of doing it. Go out there and do a free tune-up. Get to know the customer again. Re- re-energize that old relationship that this last owner didn't do anything with. Start doing a regular email campaign. If you could, get them to opt in to text messages. Very rarely, send out once a month. But the cool thing is, you can make some really cool videos, be informative as hell, Help educate them on not just your niche, but other niches. Now, here's where the secret sauce comes in, Matt. If you could build a partnership with a roofer, a builder, a real estate agent, you talk to like five or six different people and they each have 200,000 people in their database. You work together and I facilitate this through my company. I actually, I signed a non-disclosure agreement and I have their data. I can't use it for anything else, but the common emails where... We'll educate everybody about each other's business. It's new, refreshing, updating. It's not salesy. It's not a pitch. And customers love it. And we get each other a ton of business. And it's called partnership marketing. And it's amazing what you could do for free by just making these, these connections within the industry, within your own market. And I think it's the most underutilized tactic out there. Have you had any experience with doing stuff like that? Absolutely. We, we helped a company down in Melbourne effectively double their business overnight through forming a partnership with a similar, they were a plumbing, uh, they were an electrical company and uh, we had a plumbing client down there who was a very similar size, very similar dynamic business owners. Like we just knew they'd get along and we introduced them, did the same sort of thing, helped them set up a strategy where they could cross promote each other and overnight they effectively doubled each other's database. 
and you know they've pretty much been running off that. Like it, it just it was an amazing strategy that ties in exactly what you were saying there. There's a lot of ways to skin a cat. So that referral strategic alliance uh, partnership business model is so powerful, and you know we know statistically that you're going to get a lot higher conversion rate if somebody comes referred to you. And that's effectively what you're doing. You're forming a partnership with an organization which you are referring. Like they've, they've got your ticket of approval and if somebody knows, likes and trusts you, then effectively that barrier to entry is a lot lower at the initial stages. So what do you think? You know, I'm curious because I have two vendors right now that are begging me to go to Australia. They tell me they delivered to Australia already and they go, Australia, number one, you get double the prices that we get here and there's not near the competitors. And they're like, dude, you would just kill it in Australia. Literally, I think I could. I mean, I don't know the market, but I know what we do as a business. It's just, I feel like the United States, everywhere you look, there's a billboard, there's a radio ad, there's a TV ad. And I'm not saying Australia is not like that. I just don't think they're, I think it's like a 10th of what it is here. Have you ever spent time in the United States and realized any differences at all? Or what are your thoughts on that? There are a lot of differences. There's differences from the customer's perspective. There's difference from the contractor's perspective and the offering. Where a lot of them do cross over, a lot of them don't. And you know, we've been to loads of um, sales conferences overseas and with a lot of marketing experts and sales trainers in the United States and this kind of stuff. And where, where their principles, a lot of their principles seem to work quite well back in the American market a lot of that stuff didn't resonate back in Australia. So we sort of had to take a lot of what we learned and tweak it and sort of make it, make it relevant to our market. There's a lot more of a barrier of resistance here to the selling sort of style model. And, you know, it, it became very apparent that when we learnt, learnt these certain skills and took it to market, you know, there was a lot of rejection there, which was fine. But then we just meant we sort of had to tweak it a little bit to make it sort of suit, suit our market specifically. There's also a bit of, the, from a technician's point of view, you know, there's a lot of, um, I mean, obviously anywhere in the world, technicians have to be trained. And so getting that approach created the right way for an Australian technician um, was very important as well. Uh, make sure that they were comfortable, they were confident, and make sure that, you know, they weren't like trying to sell the client the wrong thing and just trying to go for the bigger ticket items and all this kind of stuff. So it sort of tied us into a really big profiling journey where we learnt, you know, there's certain type of technicians and certain type of staff will suit different roles in the organisation better. Like some guys will suit a sales role where some guys will sort of more suit, you know, more of a, a product delivery role and that kind of stuff. So that was an interesting journey. It's always an interesting journey. I think that's important as well. It's definitely not a destination. It's You're always learning. There's always new things that you can, that you can learn in that sort of realm. Yeah, I agree. I, I have technicians that no matter what, they're not going to be the top sales guys. I understand that. And, you know, I, I think some people are afraid of the word sales. I think that it scares mm. people because sales to people have a bad connotation. What sales mean is you're selling something to somebody they don't need. And I'm yeah. the opposite of that. Somebody comes to my house and informs me of what the product is and gives me choices and options, and they give me extra meaning that I do not want my shit to break, okay? I don't want it to break anytime soon. It's too much. I'm way too busy of a guy. And if they say, oh, well, this will get you by for the next year, I'm like, what will get me by for the next 10 years? Because right. I don't want this thing breaking every year. Well, in their mind, of course, they say, well, I'm just going to rig this thing and make it work because I, that's what I would want done to my house. Well, yep. you're not the customer. Get your mindset different. Sales is not a bad word. By educating the customer, Letting them know their options. Now, doing things immoral, unethical, and bad is unacceptable for my business. But yeah. there's nothing wrong with giving somebody an option. If you got a two-year-old opener and you want to show them an opener that actually they can open and close from their phone and that actually has all kinds of cool settings on it and things that they didn't know, and they decided to replace it, I don't think they're a bad guy, okay? I don't think the customer... You didn't say anything was wrong with their unit. You said this one's fine, but... I can show you an option that you might like better because you travel a lot and you want to know who's coming in and out of your house. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. And so many people out there go, 
oh yeah, I could never do that because there was nothing wrong and I'd never want that unit. Well, forget what you want. Forget that you never buy financing. Forget that you never sign a service agreement. Forget that you never had a successful business to start with. And until you do, if you get super successful by just selling the bare minimum to make it work for six months, the power to you. But I guarantee you one thing. When you go to that job every six months and you write your date on the sticker, and I see this all the time, Matt, you put your little... And I look at the job and the people call me up on the fourth time and they go, look, this company's been out three times in the last two years. It's a joke. Can you fix this thing and make it work for the next 10? And we go, yeah, "Yeah, but it's not going to be for free. They were probably nickel and diamond you charging you a service call every single time. And their whole goal in doing business is to nickel and dime you every six months to a year. And then guess what? You're missing work. You're not comfortable because the air conditioning's out or your roof's leaking or whatever's going on. And they're not truly a good business because they probably come out a week later because they're understaffed. Literally, they cannot give their employees benefits. They don't have a nice establishment to have the CSRs and the dispatchers. It's such a crock of crap. I see it all the time and I think it's a joke and they go, well, I don't like the prices you charge. And I'm like, well, my customers do. I got a bunch of five stars. They're actually more excited about the service I offered and I'm not a ripoff. I just charge more because I know how much it costs to do business. Because I built in my costs, which are triple most garage door companies, because I have nicer things. I have a real phone system. I have a real building with a real warehouse with rat trucks, with, with drug tested and background check, uniform guys. And then they show up there and it costs a lot more money for me to send someone out than it does the other guys. But then I want to make a profit. So my prices dictate what I need to make. And I'm sorry, it just doesn't make sense to me. Anybody that thinks anything otherwise than that, I, can you see any other way, Matt, that you would do business other than what I just said? One of the awesome revelations, I think, that have entered the you know the contracting world over the last 10, 15 years has been the flat rate um, upfront model. And I think that's been a real, a real shift. Well, sorry, and I might must this is sort of more for the um, you know, the emergency sort of style service guys, you know, guys that you know, the COD kind of work. But I think that's been really powerful because that really does, like you just say, put the the homeowner in a position of uh, making be able to make a choice, and you can say, "Well, here you've got four options. Which one would you like? This is the creme de la creme, and then this is the basic entry option." And it puts them in a position where they can make that decision themselves based off the information that you've given them. And I think that's really powerful. Of course, you're there to consult and advise them, but at the end of the day, it's it's up to them to make that decision, and they sign off on it. Uh, it sort of takes a lot of the argument away. Uh, back when I was doing my apprenticeship, that didn't exist. Let me ask you this, Matt: When you go shopping. I just, I was listening to a book on the way here on the podcast on the way here. And uh, I'll give you an example of what they said in the book. They did a placebo effect on a painkiller. It was just like an Advil or a Tylenol or aspirin. And they gave a select group, there was 20 of them. They gave them the 10 cent pill. They said, this is a 10 cent, uh, it costs 10 cents for this pill and it'll make your pain go away. The other group they charged, they said it was $3. So there was 20 of them that took the $3, 60% more for the $3 pill, and it was placebo, meaning there was no active ingredients in it, said the $3 pill worked better. So perceived value, when I'm shopping, and I get, you ever hear the phrase, you get what you pay for? Oh, yeah. Well, it's embedded in our heads. As human beings, we've learned that when we take the easy route, the cheap route, most of the time, we're probably getting what we pay for. So my whole point behind this is, if somebody's going to be cheap, they probably get what they pay for because there's three things that happen for contractors. You want it to be done right. You want it to be done for cheap. You want it to be done fast. So on time, on budget with the right quality. And here's what you get. You get two out of the three because you'll never get all three because the guy that's cheap, that's yeah. doing it really fast. He's using real cheap parts. The guy that's really affordable, that's doing a great job. I'll tell you the problem is he's booked out for six months. Very yeah. rarely and then here's the deal. I know cheap guys that uh, they do it right the first time. They put in a good part, but then if something breaks on the door, he can't get back out there for two weeks. So you got to decide, are you going to be good quality? Are you going to show up on time? Or are you going to be cheap? Because mm-hmm. I pick the first two. I don't pick the cheap one. Now, I think I got to be a good value and I got to give customers a better option than other cut. Co- See, I have no problem charging a customer money because I know my shit's not breaking within the next 10 years, if not 20 I always order the best. We have a whole perception about my company that we only install the best. And I've made mistakes in the past. I've chosen to work with maybe the wrong opener, maybe the wrong rollers or the wrong springs. But as of now, if a technician comes in and says, Tommy, 
these cables in Michigan and Wisconsin, they're, they're starting to rust. Can we get stainless steel rust resistant cables? You know how much money that cost me? It cost me a lot of extra money, but guess what? I do it anyway. Yeah. I, I have no problem spending the extra money to give people the best options out there. Yeah. And I think that's important as well. You know, just even, even being like that attitude, being receptive to that is really important. And I think, you know, where a lot of guys don't have that attitude. They're like, well, no, no, well, this is the one we use and this is the one we're always going to use. And that mentality will typically, you'll see that evident across many different areas of their business. It might be, like you say, from the products they use and install. It might be from um, the way their technicians are trained or not trained. It might be from you know, the perspective of the tools they use within the business, you know, how they invoice, do they use technology, are they still writing out carbon copy invoices, like all this kind of stuff. I think the dynamic there, what you basically just said is um, in a nutshell, you know, you've got to be teachable and you've got to be open to ideas and you've got to be receptive to, to different ways of doing things because if you're not, you'll just end up doing what you've always done, which will probably never get you to where you want to go. Yeah, it's the definition of insanity to keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. Right. You, you know, what I find, Matt, when I deal with most contractors is there's one big pain point that's hurting them the most. And Al talks a lot about going on your Trello top five board and setting up your top five things. Yeah. And a lot of times we throw everything in the air. We don't catch any of them. So I think the goal of the people listening should be to identify the biggest weaknesses within the business. And that might be inventory. It might be company morale. And uh, company morale might not seem like a big weakness because it doesn't necessarily day-to-day reflect on the budget, but it's huge. So what I found is just top grading. A lot of times businesses, they'll have their three employees that they keep around that maybe don't have a good call booking rate. Maybe they're just a really bad dispatcher. They're They're not sending Tom Brady to the Super Bowl when they should. Or maybe just a technician. Bad close ratio. He writes good tickets sometimes. He's off and on. Do yourself a favor. Go in there tomorrow and fire them. Get them the hell out of there. Stop marketing. Get rid of your bad employees. Lower your marketing budget. Get rid of some Valpac. Get rid of some Craigslist posts. Lower your marketing budget. Get rid of your worst employees and build up. And you'll see profit. And you'll make money. And you'll have freedom. And you'll be happy. Those are the best things I can tell you. I mean... Have you ever had to tell a business owner that they should slow down on their marketing and turn it back because other things are broken? You know, one of our um, one of our regular guests on the show, actually, awesome, awesome guy. He's a great, great business coaching program out here in Australia, and that's the first thing that he basically does when a new client enters his program. Is he says, "Guys, we've got to fill the holes in this bucket because sure, you're pouring money into the business, but you're pouring money into leads and you're getting a lot of work." but your conversions are garbage and you're just leaking. You're leaking everywhere. So his big thing is about, you know, making sure that just stop, not necessarily stop, but let's start plugging the holes so that the bucket fills faster. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, fix the holes. I always say if I'm on a boat, I'm on like a ship and I'm in the middle of the ocean, I got to fill the biggest hole because I need to continue to make this boat get me to where I need to go. But the first thing that I need to do is plug the holes. Then I'm going to make sure the sails are working right. But why would I make sure the sails are working right when the boat's leaking, you know, it's sinking? So I think that's a really good kind of illustration for people out there is to understand there's always going to be holes. Sometimes you got to work and make sure the sails are working right and you're headed in the right direction. But if there's big holes, you need to fix the holes. And I go back to my favorite KPIs, which are just a simple way of keeping score. I'm not trying to confuse people when I talk about KPIs. It's not a very tough term, but I know part of my goal is to make things very, very easy for people to understand. And sometimes I talk with PPC, KPI, you know, I talk all these anomalies and just these acronyms and people get lost. So I'm trying to really work on that. But I think that people just need to take the, keep it simple, stupid. What's wrong with your business? Identify it, fix it and continue to move forward and get the right people on the bus, you know, get the right people in this case on the ship. One of the big instances of this and our, our friend, Al Levy, uh, he, he's told me this over and over again, especially in relation to staff and finding, building the right team and finding the right team. And it's so easy for us as business owners to employ staff and not recruit correctly, not onboard correctly, not train 
them correctly and then as a result fire them because they're crap. But the reality is it's us that's crap. We haven't been through the right process. We haven't filled the holes in that process. We haven't got our recruiting down. We haven't trained them effectively. We haven't onboarded them the right way so they've got the best possible start. And then we just palm it off to them and say, well, no, they weren't the right employee. They were shit at what they did or whatever it is. And the reality is that fault falls on us. So I think that's a really, really, really common example of where as business owners, you kind of got to... You've got to take responsibility. You've got to see where those holes are so you can fill them in order to make sure you know, there's no point in keeping recruiting if you're doing it wrong. Yeah, you know, somebody asked me the other day, they said, do you believe in the people, the technology, or the systems more? And I said, the systems. They said, well, what about the people? Aren't they the most important? I said, the systems dictate the people you get. I mean, right. think about it. If you've got a great system, if there's a problem and a customer's upset and it keeps happening... I can promise you there's a problem with my system. If doors keep getting mismeasured, if uh, the crane shows up at the wrong time at an air conditioning job, there's a problem with the sequence of events in the system. And if you can fix the system, which is recruiting. So here's the deal. You're out to recruit, orient, train, retain. And if you can do those four things effectively, now you want to keep your A players. So if you think about each one of them, how do you recruit properly? Well, you got to go recruit. You're not just hiring on Craigslist or putting an ad somewhere all over Monster and Deed or all that BS, which is fine. I do it, but that's like a tenth of my tactics. Number two is you got to orient them. You got to make them make sure they fit your culture. Personality profiling is important. Getting to make sure they do ride alongs, making sure they understand the business, the owner, the management team. And look, I'm not trying to say I got everything figured out. I'm the first one to say I'm always looking for help. I'm not sitting here saying I'm the uh, Lord and Savior of the business. I'm just saying these things are commonly misconceptualized in business. And it's, it's a shame because I'm glad people are listening because every time we talk, I feel like I probably confuse people on what they need to start on because there's so many things. But that's not the goal. It's to figure out what the problems are in your business, you know? Yeah, exactly right. And I think that's where, um, you know, as business owners, you've got to be you've got to exhibit leadership, you know, you've got to look the truth head on and just sort of say, okay, well, these are problems. And very often those problems are going to come from you, you know, and that's the reality. You know, we start businesses all the time. We're not always equipped to, we don't have the right training. We don't have the right, um, it's, it's not our fault. It's just that we've never had that exposure to those, you know, to that side of, you know, the trade that we're in, you know, sure we know how to swing a hammer, but we definitely may not know how to lead people. That's stuff that can be learned, but you've got to, I suppose at the end of the day, you've got to be willing to look that reality in the face and say, okay, well, in order for us to fill these holes in this bucket, I need to change and I need to learn other things. But I mean, look, we're probably preaching to the choir here because you know people that listen to podcasts are typically guys that want to learn, right? So that's what I find so refreshing about you know people that do listen to podcasts is they are out there to learn. They are out there to improve themselves. Yeah. And I've had a look in the mirror. There's so many times. I remember the first time I met Al the biggest frustration was people don't do what we say they're going to, you know, we, we always tell them the right way to do it. And they don't do it. And the first thing you said is how much have you done role play? How much have you trained them? How much have you, they sold you that they understand what you're saying. Yeah. And so now we've implemented a lot of role playing and a lot of, there's so many things that you think, you know, but you don't do them. And we might have a list of things, but the difference is when you're so buried running the job, doing the estimates, trying to do inventory, calling advertisers, you don't have enough time to work on the business. And it's such, it's so enlightening when you can actually sit back and go, believe it or not, if you need help, you could call me up and I'll give you a list of 50 million things to do when you're not working in the business to work on it. I promise you, my job never gets old and I'm always working on it. Very rarely... I go out to a buddy's house and I'll give him a door estimate or something because I still like to know what's going on. And sometimes I do ride-alongs. But other than that, when I do a ride-along, by the way, that's working on the business. I'm documenting the good stuff. I'm understanding the negative stuff. I'm actually praising all the good stuff. I'm working on the training manual. Every time I'm doing a ride-along or going out on a sales coach coaching expedition or whatever it might be, it's working on the business. And that's where I think people misunderstand the whole working on versus in. But Matt, if you had to tell me your uh, first step to really thinking about getting involved in digital marketing, what would it be? 
first thing that I would be doing would be, first of all, I would look at the assets that you have. So I would say, and we always say that, guys, you know, before we talk about generating more work, let's talk about what you've currently got. So let's have a look at the website. Let's have a look at your database. Let's have a look at your offering. Uh, let's have a look at, I suppose, what currently happens that you're currently doing from a marketing perspective. You know, is it letterbox drops? Are you running online ads or what is that, what is that current journey? So assess the sort of where they're at. And then we would design, I'd say, what is that journey going to look like now in order to help you get to where you want to go? So do we need to build landing pages for Google Ads or do we need to start creating content so that you've got a way that you can communicate with your customers and your database? And then once you've got a bit of a strategy around that, then you're in a position where you can really start, if you need to, putting money into things like Google Ads or maybe search engine optimization. But you've got an understanding of what you need to do. So it's sort of, it's sort of more black and white. It's less gray. Once you've got that, then it's really a matter of um, implementing and, as you say, tracking and measuring. So we want to make sure that certain things, you know, we want to, because we don't know yet, right? Because we haven't done it. So we want to figure out what's working, what could be working better, what's not working, so let's get rid of it. And building a bit of data into the system so that we can understand, you know, what's actually, what's actually again, helping us get to that next stage. And then just doubling down on the, on the things that are working. That's effectively, I mean, it's not rocket science at the end of the day. It's just a matter of, I think where people drop the ball is they just don't spend the time in the strategy stage and they don't understand, I suppose, what their assets are or what they need in order to help that campaign run as effectively as it can. Yeah, 100%. And you might not be with the right agency or the right people because I tell you, one day I got a flood of calls. I went to a different agency and it was because it was a partnership with one of the pay for performance deals. So I had what's called a base buy. Not trying to confuse anybody, but let's just put it this way. I had a campaign going on that I was successful at. So I needed to do another campaign in order to do this marketing source. And they made the phone call. My calls came in four times more than my current marketing campaign. But it turns out they were all remote control for your garage door opener, which were, right. it led to very little revenue. So just because you do a campaign and have tried it doesn't mean it doesn't work. You got to know the right stuff to look at. And I got to right. tell you, I have a master's degree in business, but I have a master's degree in online marketing. I mean, I have a whole business surrounded around online marketing. And I can tell you that just because it doesn't work, online marketing, every two years, it's going to start to double the amount of results you're getting. It's exponential growth. And if you don't become part of it, you're going to become extinct. So I'm sorry if you had a bad experience out there. I'm sorry if things didn't go your way the first time or the second or the third. But you need to jump back in. You need to do your research, just like your customers do with you when they check Yelp and they go on Google reviews and they check Angie's list and then they call referrals. You need to do the same thing when you're finding a company you want to work with. You know, Matt, I, I really enjoyed this. I'd like to finish up with a few things if you got a minute. Yeah, man. So if you had to recommend three books out there for any type of service business or just something you believe in, do you have three books that you really, really like? Oh, man, you have come to the right guy to talk about books. I am a book geek. So I actually, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out with the site shed and I always put book reviews in there. So the first one I would say for any of the listeners out there that have not yet read Al Levy's The Seven Power Contractor, that book is fantastic. It's a short book. It's a short read. You probably get through it in a couple of nights. But man, he just really breaks down all of those departments within an organization. And it's, he just communicates it so well. Like I so recommend that book. The other book I would recommend is called The One Thing. Yeah, that's, that's by the real estate guy. Um, Gary oh, Keller. Gary Keller from Keller Williams. Yep. Yeah, so that is a fantastic book. I want—I don't know about you, Tom, but I'm one of those guys that goes through my book and highlights and dog ears and just does all that kind of stuff so I can go back and find the important parts. And I look through this book now, I'm flicking through it, and there's hardly a page in there without the highlighter <laughs> or dog eared pages. So I highly recommend that. The One Thing by Gary Keller. There's another fantastic book called The One Page Marketing Plan, which is from a guy called Alan Dibb. He's an Australian guy, actually, but that's a that's a really really good book. Again, that way, that book is just littered with um with highlighter and dog eared pages. There is one that I read recently called "Lead the Ship." That's from um, Edward and Rebecca Plant. Now, that's a really good book as well. Edward came went from a um, military background, and Rebecca was a, an elite athlete, and they just talk about some of the strategies to help business owners, I suppose, move forward and 
create great culture and you know drive growth and attract, attract the right team and that kind of stuff. And just yesterday, I finished reading Gary V's Crushing It and right. Crushing It. Yeah, I don't know. So there's there's Crush It, which is the original book, which is brilliant as well. And then Crushing It is another book which which refers back a lot to Crush It, but it talks a lot about you know some of the things and some of the actions that you should be taking in order to make yourself show up and build build a personal brand and that kind of stuff. So there's a handful of books for you. The one book that I refer people to more than anything over the years is one called Personality Plus by Florence Litow. And that book really talks about uh, how to understand people's personalities, like we spoke about before, profiling. That book changed my life. So anyone that doesn't understand personality profiling, you'll see it in many different forms. You may have heard of disc profiling or you know whatever. There's many different spins on it, but it dates back to a Greek mythology. So it's really, it's really worth investing in, in one of those um, books that um, helps you understand the different types of personality traits and how you can relate to them. Um, yeah, I love that. I'm a big personality profiler. I'm a disc trainer, actually. But you can't say enough about it. But you really got to take it, learn it, and remember it, and study it. Because if you don't, it's just one of those things that you really can't put on your notch. And also, anybody that gets a chance to really, really spend some time studying non-verbal behaviors, so basically hand gestures, uh, body language, anything like that, That'll advance you so much further. Personality profiling and body language are two huge things that could lead you to one of the top, whether it's salespeople, coaches, leadership, all the above. Or even if you want to go get women or or get men at the bar, it works for all of them. (laughs) Yeah, right. And there's another really good book as well called The Five Love Languages, which sounds really girly, but it's actually quite powerful. It's by a guy called Gary Chapman. Yeah, and, I got um, it on my desk right now. And there's a five love, love languages for business as well. Right. Yeah. So that's that kind of ties into what you were saying there. Understanding, um, understanding, I suppose, different characteristics. So how you can relate to people. It's all about how you can relate to people. That was another really powerful book, which which had a big impact on me 15 years ago when I first read it. You know, there's a book. I got to tell you, this book. If you get a chance, you need to check this book out. I've been recommending it. I read probably. Three to four books a week. I got a lot on Audible. Uh, it's called Blue Fishing. It's the art of making things happen. I okay. see Sims. You're, you'll dig it. And then, of course, you got to read December 3rd, The Home Service Millionaire. <laughs> That's yours, is it? This is my book coming out in about, about a week, actually. I'm really looking forward to it. It's uh, two years worth of work put into this book, and I, it's going to blow your mind. I think it's... Uh, yeah, well, send me, a a copy and I'll, send me a copy and I'll read it and review it for our customers. I'm sure they'll, they'll love it. They'll be all over it. Yeah, I will. I will. I'll send you a copy. And uh, is there anything, final thoughts you wanted to share with the audience here, Matt? I would say one of the, the big revelations that I've had lately and I've been working really, really hard on both for my business and for our clients helping them influence similar things is around productivity. And, you know, the reality of, you know, people being busy and just being busy, being busy. Lately, we've put a lot of emphasis into time blocking and helping guys allocate specific time. And it actually came uh, largely through what I learned while I was reading The One Thing. You know, he, he's a big advocate of time blocking. You may have, are you familiar with the Pomodoro technique at all, Thomas? Uh, not the Pomodoro technique, <laughs> but I, I always tell people to use their Google Calendar or Outlook and put time on there to, to get things done. If you right. put the time on there, if you don't block it out, it won't get done. Right, right. So it's similar, I suppose, but the, the Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro is, um, means tomato in, in Italian. However, it's basically a timer. And what it does is it'll help you, it, you basically for 25 minutes or 30 minutes, you allocate that entire time to one task. And then after that task, you take a five-minute break. And then after you do it again for another 30 minutes, then you take another five-minute break. And basically... During that time, you don't answer phone calls, you don't you don't answer emails, you just work on that one thing. And it's unbelievable how much work you can get done when you have no distractions and you're just focused on the one task and you don't get away, you don't leave the desk. You basically sit there. Uh, if you need to go to the toilet, you hang on. <laughs> and it, it's just incredible when you look back at the week and you've got a, a list of all these different time blocks that you've done and you've recorded how much you actually get done. There's tools that enable you to do it. Like I use one at the moment called Pomo to do. 
um, and it syncs to your phones and your computers and you can list in there all the things that you're currently working on and then you can allocate time blocks to them. It's just a really powerful way to keep, keep in control. So I highly recommend guys do that. But again, you know, if you, if you want further clarification on that, go and read The One Thing because it really is a great book. Well, you know, one of the things I wanted to throw in there too is uh, I have a whiteboard in my kitchen and in my family room. I whiteboard every day. And it's a game changer. It really, really is a game changer. Look, I, I spent a lot of time whiteboarding, figuring out stuff, and then I documented. I built shortcuts on my cell phone to every single Google Doc. I got about 20 of them. But I just hit a button and I add to it. And I, the difference that I find from really successful people is they actually review their documents. They review their notes. Yeah. 99% of people, they make a lot of notes, but they never go back to them. They never look at them. They don't review them. So yeah. that's changed in my life in the last year. And it's a huge one. But uh, Matt, I love you, man. I uh, I love your <laughs> accent. I love... Uh, you're the first guy I've had on from really, other than Canada, <laughs> any other country. So I'm glad we got to spend some time today. And uh, Absolutely. And everybody's got to listen. You got to check out the Site Shed podcast. That's Matt. Matt, how does people get more of you? If they want to hear, or they want to get your newsletter or whatever, how, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, the SiteShed.com is the website. So you can head across there and you can subscribe for our, um, our Toolbox Talks, which is the newsletter. And the newsletter is effectively a curation. So we summarize the podcast that came out that week. Uh, we talk about uh, any books that I've read. I'll talk about anything that I've learned, any lessons that I've learned throughout the week. We'll talk about events that we've got coming up. We run events all over the world. So we talk about those. Basically, yeah, just curation of stuff that's happening. Conversations, of course. So we've, have, we've got an online a Facebook, private Facebook community of 4,500 global members. There's some amazing conversations that happen in there. So um, if you want to head across to that, you can, look to, um, you can search the Facebook, the, the site shared private Facebook group. You can... Click to join there and Talia will let you in after you answer a couple of questions. But that's a really good community there. I thoroughly encourage you guys to go out there and check that out because it's um, there's some really, really good conversations and it's all it's all free. And then, of course, yeah, if, you, if you're listening to the podcast, which you obviously are because you're listening to this, you can head across to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, wherever, and you can search The Site Shed and you'll, you'll find the podcast there. I think we have live now episode 100 and, uh, 178 will go live this week, but we've, we've backlogged to 190. So, um, yeah, there's a lot, lot of content there. I love it. Well, yeah. you kicked butt today. I mean, I love digital marketing. It's my biggest passion in life. I love yeah. sales and I love marketing. I mean, I'm starting <laughs> to like the other stuff slowly but surely because I'm getting better at it. I suppose we should give a big shout out to our, our friend, Al, Al Levy, that introduced us as well. Yeah, Al's a man. I work with him every day, practically. I'm like his son, I feel like. He's <laughs> taking me under his wing. He's always there. He's there to guide me, help me. And I'm a big fan of getting a coach. He's one of my coaches. And uh, Al is definitely a wise, wise man. And I couldn't say anything. Just he's, he's super, he's basically the opposite of me in a good way. <laughs> like we feed off of each other and it's amazing yeah. to have him. So. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, Matt, I appreciate everything and uh, we will talk uh, tomorrow. Absolutely. And when you have you on the Sideshade podcast. All right, buddy. Thanks, Matt. Hey, guys, I really appreciate you tuning into the podcast. I wanted to let you know that my book is available right now on Amazon. It's called The Home Service Millionaire. That's homeservicemillionaire.com. Just go to the website. It'll show you exactly where and how to buy the book. I poured two years of knowledge into this book and I had 12 contributors, everybody from the COO at Home Advisor to the CEO of Valpac and of course, Ara, the CEO of Service Titan. It tells you how to have the right mindset and become a millionaire and think like a millionaire. It goes into exactly how to turn on lead generation. Have those phones ringing off the hook for the customers that you want to be calling where you can make money and get great reviews. It also goes into simple things like how to attract A players. Listen, if you want a great apple pie, you need to buy good apples and you need to know where to buy those apples. And it also talks about simple things like knowing how to keep the score. You should have your financial check every week. You should know exactly what's coming in and out of your account. You should know when to cut advertising that's not working. And more than anything, you should know how to cut employees that aren't making it for you. Listen, you might have a big heart, but this book is going to show you how to make decisions built on numbers. I hope you pick up the book and I really appreciate everything. I hope you're having a great day. Tune in next week. Thank you.